please allow me to introduce uh, to my immediate right, Hazuki Mori, who is currently with the World Economic Forum. She previously served as an expert on the space application sections in the UN's UNUSA, um, and has worked at JAXA as well. So thank you for joining the panel. Next to her is Julie Lawless. Um, she's the Director of Strategic Business Development for Exo Analytics Solutions, responsible for connecting innovative technologies with critical customer mission needs. And prior to that, she worked uh, for the US Department of Defense and the intelligence communities, and she has provided technical, programmatic, and systems engineering support. And next to Chris, we have Takeshi Aishima. Um, he is the co-founder and co-CTO of Axel Space Corporation. Takeshi joined Axel Space in 2008 as a co-founder and now is the co-chief CTO responsible for the spacecraft technology. And since February, he's also the head of the Axel Liner Business Division. Thank you very much for joining us um, on, the, on the third panel where we are going to focus a bit on, um, on how industry is fitting in with the national and international systems for regulating space. So uh, if I could ask uh, Takeshi, please, to start. Um, Axel Space has developed and operated 10 microsatellites. Um, what sorts of best practices for space sustainability did you follow while those satellites were being built? And have you made changes uh, for the newer satellites that you are still designing and thinking of launching? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your introduction. Uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, Access Space, is uh, a relatively old startup in Japan, <laughs> established in 2008. And uh, as the uh, early age of uh, uh, new space uh, emerging, uh, early in uh, uh, 2010, uh, and at that time, uh, uh, both uh, launch service providers, or uh, we uh, small set developers or small set operators, are not so conscious in, in space sustainability. So uh, uh, the uh, small sets are launched to very very high altitude that remains very very long as a space debris after uh, an admission. And uh, small set technologies are not so mature at that time, so our uh, early uh, satellites uh, did not have a proportion system. But uh, after uh, the technology matures and we do uh, operate our own uh, constellations, uh, then uh, constellations have a huge impact in space environment. At the same time, uh, the technology matures, so uh, uh, small sets uh, can be capable of uh, 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 orbit maintenance or collision avoidance. So uh, through those uh, experience, uh, we are gonna, uh, now developing a, a, a more common standardized uh, bus platform and also operation platform uh, that can not only achieve uh, customers' uh, various missions, but also at the same time uh, achieve uh, space sustainability. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Julie, how how have you found that SSA or situational awareness um, can enhance space sustainability? And and what about your company, Exo Analytic? Um, do you have priorities within that sort of uh, sustainability environment? Sure. Yeah, I think it's um, one of the really critical things um, for space sustainability is knowing where you are, <laughs> knowing how to behave where you are, um, and being a good neighbor, right? So this is my first time in Japan, and uh, here, you, as the d panel is titled, you stand to the left on the escalators. And, you know, I've observed that and observed that around me, and many of the escalators say, don't walk at all, just stand, because it's safer. Um, in Washington, D.C., where I'm from, we stand on the right. Um, so when I come here to Tokyo, I have to observe this neighborhood, per se, um, and behave accordingly, right? And it's, there's no, sometimes it's not a matter of what's 
more responsible because mm -hmm. right versus left, it's not one is not better than the other, but it's important that you act accordingly with what those around you are doing, and so that you're not disrupting each other. So space situational awareness gives you very detailed and uh, even more SSA will give you more accurate information about where you are, where you should be, and help you understand that neighborhood and how your behavior should be. And there's some government programs that are coming on board that we've heard a little bit about, um, like TRAX and EOSST, um, where they're really going to validate that accuracy of where things are, how they're behaving, and if they're going to maneuver and all of the critical information that you need to know so that we can avoid collisions, but also be a responsible neighbor in space. Thank you. I like that it's not that the left or the right is better. It's right. just um, being, a, being a good neighbor. Um, Hazuki, please tell us what the World Economic Forum is doing in this environment um, to foster sustainability. So first of all, thank you so much for inviting the World Economic Forum and welcome all of you to Tokyo. Um, maybe half of you are Japanese, but yeah, to all of our international um, guests, really welcome to Tokyo. So um, my name is Suzuki. I'm based in the Tokyo office of the World Economic Forum. And at the World Economic Forum, so we're a public, uh, we're an international organization that fo focuses on public-private cooperation. So we're tackling issues that cannot be solved by just one country or one company. And of course, space sustainability is one of these topics. And at the World Economic Forum, um, we've been doing space activities for a few years now. We've been focusing a lot on the space economy. Maybe some of you, some of you have seen our report that we did with McKinsey earlier this year, um, uh, talking about how big the space economy will be, so 1.8 trillion USD by 2035. Um, we also focus on Earth observation, so um, we look at it from a not just a space perspective, but from climate tech. So we see Earth observation as something that can um, help in climate tech, um, climate adaptation and mitigation. We also look at the inclusivity side, so helping developing nations acquire space technologies, um, really build space programs. And the fourth pillar we do is sustainability. And uh, for sustainability, we've been doing a few things. Um, one of the, let's say, famous ones is probably the rating, the space sustainability rating that we um, did a few years ago. I'm happy to see that there's going to be an announcement tomorrow as part of the program. Um, besides that, um, last year we uh, published the Space Industry Debris Mitigation Recommendations in collaboration with ESA and uh, other industry partners. And we also um, just recently, a few days ago actually, um, published an agenda article on our website uh, talking about sustainable and responsible space exploration. So um, we have seven key recommendations um, linked to that, so it would be great if all of you can um, have a look. And also um, regarding space debris, we actually did a workshop um, not just with the space sector, but bringing in the financial sector and talking about financial space debris mechanisms like from the insurance side to make sure that we have a financial mechanism that can support these activities. And a new activity um, we have this year is um, in collaboration with the Saudi Space Agency. Um, we organized, we established a new center called the Center for the uh, Center for Space Futures. Um, it's hosted by the Saudi Space Agency. It's like a joint venture between the Saudi Space Agency and us, and we will be focusing on sustainability uh, from there as well. So we've been doing a lot of things um, really to support the industry's needs. And as a multi-stakeholder platform, we don't only talk with industry. Uh, we talk with governments, civil society. We bring in everyone that's needed in the discussion. So, so yeah, I think it's like a platform and um, we hope to keep engaging with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So, so interesting. Um, Takeshi, back to you. What do you think as an established operator, um, what do you think uh, your role is to promote best practices for the newer space actors? Mm -hmm. How can you um, speak about it, encourage it, participate the participation. What do you think uh, you can do to help the newer actors mm -hmm. be responsible? 
Okay, thank you. Uh, from the viewpoint of a satellite develop developer uh, and industry side, uh, 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 current uh, debris standard or guideline, it's written for uh, uh, generic purposes. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes it's uh, too abstract or uh, how can I say, uh, it's difficult to uh, interpret to actual or satellite design, especially in small sat design, uh, that's uh, resource or uh, uh, capabilities limited. So uh, that's why we uh, developed a green spacecraft standard. Uh, uh, that's our own uh, understanding and implementation uh, to, to small satellite. So I it's not perfect, but, uh, uh, but e easy to, uh, uh, more, more practical uh, implementation uh, as a small set. So uh, I think those kind of uh, uh, practical approach uh, would be a good reference to, to newcomer, uh, uh, not only uh, satellite developers, but also uh, uh, satellite operators that utilize these uh, various uh, small set platforms. Um, thank you. I think that's so important um, to, to have the established operators help lead the way. Um, Julie, I think with Exo Analytic, you've seen a shift um, in the last few years uh, about behavior in space. Um, and um, do you think the trend is increasingly responsible <laughs> um, or, or, or no? Do we still... Are we still needing pressure from governments or organizations to to bring about better practices, shall we say? Sure. So kind of like I said last time, I I don't want to say necessarily irresponsible versus responsible, mm -hmm. just like what's better, the right or the left. Um, however, there are some circumstances where it is quite obviously irresponsible. And we have seen um, some very risky things in space. We've seen some very provocative operations in space. Um, now, the operators of those spacecraft perhaps will deny the, you know, that it is provocative or that it was just for a different reason. So we can't say for one reason or another, but if we feel that our operations and or our, our satellites are at risk, it feels provocative to us. So we have observed a great deal of dynamic space operations in the last couple years and uh, dynamic space maneuvers that just really didn't exist before. Um, space behaviors are, are very different now. And one of those reasons is because the capabilities of satellites are more advanced. Right, so we have different propulsion systems and they give them more freedom of maneuverability. Um, previously, you know, a satellite would go into space and especially in geo, would go and try to get as far away from everybody as possible and just sit and do their mission. And now we have a lot of spacecraft, even in geostationary orbit, that are maneuvering and are zipping around and are doing a lot of what we observe as abnormal behavior, um, but it's just part of their, their con-ops. It's part of their mission to do certain things like that. Um, so that's new. Whether or not it's irresponsible or responsible, it's something that we must adjust to. And if we need to, we need to also be aware of things like that. So if people are going to do things that are a bit provocative or just different, it's important that we know, so if we need to maneuver or we need to not maneuver when they are doing something like that, then we can make sure we're avoiding collisions and um, no one's mission is compromised. So I should have said this in the beginning, but ExoAnalytics Solutions has a ground-based network of 400 telescopes, um, and we specialize in geostationary orbit persistent coverage. So we monitor over approximately 3,000 objects in geostationary orbit. So we see everybody up there, not just US. Um, you know, we see, we see everything up there. And actually 10% of the objects we observe are not in the public catalog. So some of that is debris, 
which is as more people enter space, debris is increasing. Um, but some of them are, you know, using some of these more advanced technologies where perhaps they're not as bright or they are moving around. So it's hard to correlate who they are and they're not in the catalog. So uh, that is also increasing that there's more objects in space. Um, but we we see it all and <laughs> we've seen a lot of a lot of wild things up there in the past couple of years. I'm very, very interesting. Um, Okay, Hazuki, coming back to the new debris mitigation guidelines that you mentioned. Of course, the IADC came out with guidelines 25 years ago, and more recently, uh, uh, the long-term sustainability guidelines. So how are the WEF's guidelines adding to this catalog of, 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 of guidelines? Thank you. Yeah, we're very aware that there's many organizations, many uh, groups that are already discussing this. Um, we had a pre-workshop actually earlier in the weekend. There was CONFERS, IADC, UN, um, AIA, JISOA. There are so many organizations that have these recommendations. And as a World Economic Forum, we're just trying to amplify this effort. We're not trying to clash. We're not saying anything that's very different at all. I think all of these recommendations are similar. There's different things here and there, but I think the whole um, direction is that we really need to tackle these issues. And for the, um, us, uh, we have 27 industry players, and we also worked with ESA to get this together. And we, our target is not only the space sector, so um, as the organization that has um, connections with all the different industry sectors, we wanted to make sure that everyone understands this as a problem. It's a global problem problem. And space is linked to so many of the other industries that we needed to make sure that um, they knew about this as well. So in that sense, um, our document is not that technical, but it's really to raise awareness of what's happening there. And some of the topics that are mentioned are, as you already mentioned, like post-mission disposal, collision avoidance, maneuverability, propulsion, data sharing, and a lot of the financial measures that should be taken into place. And it proposes as longer-term goals and requests for policymakers further study on the environmental capacity, so really knowing who's up there, what's happening, but also um, continue uh, for the government to continue support for the investments that are happening in this era, and also encouraging and incentivizing data sharing, um, coordination, and adoption of these international standards. And we published it last year, and after um, we did, um, there were many companies that reached out to us saying, we want to sign and become a signatory as well. And of course, um, as I mentioned earlier, this was one of the efforts that um, you know, the many industry players have signed on to different things, but I think it's the right direction, and I think it led to the whole industry really realizing that we need to take measures. And um, I really think that commercial actors are the ones who need their voices to be heard. Um, the commercial actors are the ones that are building and launching and operating these valuable assets that we have in space. So as the forum, um, we really want to be the platform where we bring together these important players, also with the government's also with the civil societies and everyone that's engaged. And I think um, the World Economic Forum brings a special unique uh, uh, place in that sense because we also have community industry sectors um, in different places. So um, when we talk about financial schemes, we have a whole community of banks, insurance companies that are also interested in this. So we can really bring those players together as well. So I think we don't want to overlap, we just want to amplify and really bring together the right um, interested players in this. Um, thank you. I think yeah, the, the WAF will definitely be a, a hub for, for, for these kinds of discussions. Chris, do we have the poll answer? Yeah, so I've been looking at some of the, the poll uh, responses out there, and I'm looking at this the, the second poll, which is, and I think I, I'll... I'll give the the panelists the the couple options that were that were you know people could respond to the question was what is the best way for commercial actors to influence the development of rules norms and laws so of course we're thinking about the international system and the national system but what can commercial actors do to you know yeah influence what um what these rules should be especially rules 
promoting space sustainability. And really the poll results were kind of tied. They were kind of um, uh, homogenous. It was, um, some folks said, well, they can strongly interact with national regulators. So go to your national regulators, have conversations with them, have strong uh, relationships with them, and see if you can you know, influence uh, what national rules can be. Uh, ones that suit you commercially, but also, um, you know, uh, foster space sustainability. However, just as many people said, well, you should be present in international fora. You should be engaging with COPUS and other international fora. Somehow, the commercial sector, through whatever way it can, and our l last panel said that there are ways to do it, should have a presence at the international fora. Uh, that got five votes. Pretty good. Uh, but, however, the other the other option was bold initiatives and ambitious commercial plans which set precedent and influence discussions elsewhere meaning nice way of saying go ahead do what you can do do what you want to do and in that way you will be able to set precedent for other actors including other stakeholders national regulators international fora to see well that commercial actor did that that commercial actor did that maybe that's what we should be adopting so if there's any reactions from 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 you from that what do you think is the best way or some of the best ways for commercial actors to foster the the development of rules where do you go national level international level or just say we're going to set precedent oh, well uh, i think uh i can say uh, uh, uh responsible uh, operators uh, that uh, takes uh, into consideration space sustainability uh, should be rewarded by, by some uh, uh, evaluation system or something. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh. Any any other reactions or <laughs> what what do you th what would you recommend? And you can say it in a personal capacity or you know <laughs> uh, however you want to address it. I think I kind of uh, personally perhaps straddle the lines um, of both of those answers because I have worked in emerging technologies and uh, in industry, but also for Department of Defense and Department of Defense is very conservative and there's rules and then the commercial industry and um, you know, I, I worked at DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is very um, per almost provocative technologies and rapid capabilities for the Department of Defense. So it's kind of think outside of the box um, in, in those walls, um, but also be responsible. So um, what I would want new actors in space to do is do the cool new missions, push the envelope, but again, be a good neighbor and maybe publish certain things, you know, so for example, publishing your maneuver plans, I think would be really helpful. I'm not saying don't maneuver, I'm not saying change your mission, but let us know what your maneuver plans are, or if you, that is kind of counter to your mission, perhaps uh, at least maneuver times, right? So we have seen so many sub two kilometer close approaches two kilometers, that is terrifying in space. Um, and you think space is so big, then how is this happening in geostationary orbit? Sub two kilometers, sometimes that's with space debris, sometimes that's with active satellites, and oftentimes it's because two satellites maneuvered at the same time. Um, so if one had stayed still, it wouldn't have been that close, right? So if we had known about the times, maybe we don't have to disclose all of your plans, because I realize people have their own interests for doing the things that they do, but things like that, I, uh, like publishing your, your plans or times, um, I would also, I think, it, I think it's important to acknowledge that space is hard, um, and so therefore everybody that plays in space needs to assume responsibility. So make sure that your satellite works, make sure you're behaving properly, you're doing the best you can so that you're not just putting up another piece of space junk. And as you mentioned, deorbiting plans, things like that, things that can help you be a good neighbor uh, in space because it 
space is big, but it's not that big when you have all the people going to the same place. So assuming that responsibility and that goes for the investments as well and for the actual satellite uh, manufacturers and operators. Uh, Hazuki, do you think there's do you think there's a W a WEF approach to this or an answer to this? What, what would your response be? So at the World Economic Forum, when we build a community, when we want to build a big project or initiative, we're always looking for champions in the industry that can really lead the discussions. You know, take force as a company. So for for us, it's really encouraging when we see companies that have technology that have amazing business strategies that can really lead the discussions. And I think the World Economic Forum, we are a platform where we can help you uh, take what uh, your visions to COPUS or to you know government discussions. Because for COPUS, um, m many of you probably know, um, it, it's more towards the member states, right? So it's not a place where industry can really um, directly influence. So you have to first talk with your national, you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the regulators in your own country. But um, you can take it from that direction, but also as an industry association or using platforms like us uh, to really raise the voice. And when you do that, if your company is like a champion, you have the technology, you have the skills, you, you have something that wants to make us help you and push you, I think that really helps. Thank you for that. So, uh, Julie, you've already kind of answered this just a little bit in your in your previous uh, response, but I, I want to be explicit about it. Um, and, you know, if a new space actor comes to you, a new, a new commercial actor, maybe an emerging space company uh, country comes to you and says that they want to be a responsible actor in space. Um, and this is for everyone. What do you think are the top three things that you would recommend to them? <laughs> If you're in Leo, make sure that you can maneuver. So um, both for collision avoidance, but also for deorbiting yourself when it is time. Uh, we do not need more congestion in Leo. I think that's pretty critical. Uh, but it's, that's, I mean, if you're a commercial company, that there's a cost to that, isn't it, right? Sure, sure. Uh, there absolutely is, yeah. Um, if, if I was queen of space for mm -hmm. the day, this would be <laughs> one right of now. my big ones. Floor is yours. Um, again, I want to emphasize to make sure that, you know, do everything you can to make sure that it works. Um, but that goes for your all the other components too, so your ground infrastructure. There's a lot of commercial companies that will put a satellite up, but they don't actually have the ground infrastructure to really complete their mission. And so then their satellite is actually not as functional or as successful um, because they didn't think through the whole, the whole process. Um, and then the last one's a little unique, but I would say I mentioned earlier, it also goes for investors. I think it's amazing that venture, venture capitalists and other types of investors have really um, accelerated the space you know, community, access to space, rapid launch, all of these things, it's amazing. Um, you know, I've been obsessed with space my whole life and now I think it's the best time to be working in space. It just gets more exciting every day. So I appreciate the investors, but I would encourage them to also assume responsibility and really understand that there are risks associated. So don't just write a $10 million check to just anybody that asks for one because space is cool. They have a responsibility too to really, you know, make sure that they're covering their bases and we're putting up high quality space assets that really can be sustainable and we can all operate in this regime together. So let's go over that again. The first one was <laughs> if you're in Leo, make sure you can maneuver. The yes. second <laughs> one was? Uh, the second one was to make sure it works. And the third one about investing? Well, yeah, to, that investors also have to assume responsibility. I think both the operators, the manufacturers, and the investors need to assume responsibility that space is dangerous, it is hard, um, and we, you have to be a good, a good player up there. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. I know I had to come back to you for that. <laughs> yeah, no um, worries. So let's go. Maybe, Hazuki, would you like to answer that? Yeah. Same question, three. The first thing I would say is be transparent to your government. You, you need to talk to your government. You need to make sure that you communicate with them so that they know what kind of regulations or what kind of you know international guidelines um, can be set. Um, the second is really um, be transparent to your peers. So everyone in the space industry, all the different other operators, um, 
And then I think the third point is be transparent to the public in the sense of um, making sure that you have support from the public side. But also I think that really helps because when you want to find investors or partners, um, being transparent in your business, what you're going to do is really going to help that. So yeah, it's all about transparency and trust. Great. Now, finally, <laughs> three, you got three. Okay, uh, uh, I recommend uh, first uh, to refer to the uh, practical uh, guidelines uh, that will uh, help you make uh, operation plan that is sustainable or uh, as the early stage of uh, your uh, space project, not uh, right before launch. <laughs> That's very, very important. And also, uh, the key is uh, in addition to collision avoidance and, and, and also, uh, I think, a reliable uh, uh, day orbit system after end of mission. And uh, yeah, uh, there are uh, those new technologies that are available even for uh, small satellites. And uh, we, we actually are uh, developing a drag sail uh, that's, that uh, accelerate uh, the, the day orbit. Not only really, not only really that, that uh, but also there are uh, various uh, some tether, uh, electrical tether or something. Uh, uh, those kind of uh, reliable or the orbit uh, system you you need to adopt. And uh, finally, uh, uh, for, for operators, choose a, a satellite platform and operation platform uh, that is takes uh, into consideration about uh, space sustainability. Not only cost, not only performance, uh, but also uh, uh, space sustainability. All right, great, thank you for that. So looking to conclude in the next few minutes so we can wrap up at six a little bit earlier than that That time says. Um, I want to first, Ruth, I want to make sure that I give you the floor if you have any other hot pursuit questions of these folks. Uh, and if not, maybe just a last, uh, last, last comments from anyone that they, any message that you feel that you uh, wasn't uh, you know prompted by one of our questions if there's anything you, you definitely want to communicate to our audience so but Ruth was there something that anything no I think that I mean I think one of the questions from the audience is is basically that it's sort of okay. you know what 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 haven't we discussed that could be done either by the government agencies or by the individual operators um, that could bring us closer to uh, better behavior Okay, we have <laughs> we have milked <laughs> this topic. I, I actually I Go ahead. wasn't sure who was going to start, but I do have kind of a foot stomp, and obviously I'm here representing a space situational awareness company, so that is where my passion and my heart is. And I think it's just I want to foot stop that SSA is so critical for appropriate behavior and operations in space and sustainable operations um, and mission success. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that we see nearly everything in geo, and some of the things we've observed are very scary. There's people, you know, doing very risky things. There's near collisions, two kilometers is terrifying to me. It would be even more terrifying if I owned that satellite, right? Um, we've seen things that appear to be in preparation for a conflict-based scenario. So things you wouldn't necessarily do if you were only focused on your mission, minding your own business. Um, that we have observed some things such as, uh, you know, was similar to um, aircraft combat in World War II. We're seeing that between satellites. We're seeing chasing down of other satellites or trailing satellites. Um, that makes me nervous. That keeps me up at night. And the more space situational awareness we have, the more we can hold people, the more we can protect our space assets, but the more we can also hold people responsible for being those good neighbors and uh, having proper etiquette in space. Thank you. All right. I think with that, we should move to conclude. We've done a two-hour, nine-panel, du dual-moderated session that covers international, national, and operator-level governance of space activities while still fostering the commercial industry. Uh, I want to, uh, let me think here, 
just give a round of applause to these last set of panelists for their remarks. Thank you.